Okay, on this special topic today, we're going to whip through our uh, this test here, and then we're going to jump into our presentation. Um, engine's been removed from a high mileage drive vehicle and it's off and refilled for several serious oil leaks after the engine is reinstalled and started. A transmission fluid leak appears from the bell housing area. Technician A says the front pump seal was probably damaged. That's a torque converter seal. During the repair, technician B says the PCV system needs to be checked since it might have caused engine oil leaks. Okay, so okay, that's basically going to be uh, well. That transmission leak, yes, but if all of the uh, if it had several serious oil leaks, you need to know that the PCV system's working because if crankcase pressure blow by gets trapped in a crankcase, it'll blow every daggum seal on that motor. Mm -hmm. Every seal on the motor will be blown. If, and I've seen people fix all them oil leaks and not do anything with the PCV system. And it's a recipe for it coming back with all that crap being done again. And if you didn't check it, you're going to have to do it over. A customer complains, that's us be both. A customer complains that her gas pedal sticks at the top of travel and pops loose as she continues to apply foot pressure to the pedal. The problem is probably due to sticking throttle cable. A dirty throttle body. Really? That plate will stick in that more, and when you give it a gas, it feels like you're standing on a rock and all of a sudden it goes poof. Not yet. Okay. Of course, he don't have a throttle cable on his power stroke diesel, so he's not going to feel that, right? Okay. For PO401 code, will probably be due to what? PO401 code means there's no EGR flow. Clogged EGR passages are very, very common. All of this stuff that you know, gums up on the inside of the intake loves to clog EGR passages. And a lot of times you get a PO401. How do you do this? I want to actually open the EGR valve. What should happen when we rate when we open the EGR valve artificially? Whether we do it with our scan tool, if it's linear or whatever. What happens? What what should the engine do? It should run ragged, ragged at idle. Got it? If you open the EGR valve and it don't run ragged at idle, and Jen says, all right, that thing's clogged up. And you gotta do whatever you gotta do to unclog them. Uh, misfiring, it just usually means taking the throttle body off, taking the EGR, because the EGR is gonna be feeding this stuff right there behind the throttle body. Uh, and you clean all them passages out. Uh, a misfire and spark plug will cause the oxygen sensor to indicate what kind of exhaust? Lean. Lean exhaust because the oxygen that's going in there is going to be smelling the oxygen because the oxygen sensor couldn't care less about fuel, all it's smelling is oxygen. An air leak between an air leak between the mass airflow sensor and the throttle body will cause A, long fuel trim readings to correct to the positive, B, long fuel trim readings long fuel trim readings connect to the negative, C, oxygen sensor failure, or D, canister purge failure. Long fuel trim to read it right to the positive. The positive because it's going to try to add fuel to go with that air that the oxygen sensors are picking up, right? Mm -hmm. After undergoing, undergoing major work in the body shop and those dark conditions being investigated, the PCM won't communicate with the scan tool and there's no reference voltage present at any sensor. Technician A says the body shop may have damaged the PCM while welding body panels. Technician B says power and ground of the PCM should be checked. What should be pursued first? B. Power and ground. However, we had one of the, a Dodge in here that they worked on that auto body here, and it, they fried the engine controller by welding. And what he said was, well, I disconnected the battery cable. Well, you can actually still weld and run stuff through the engine controller. What do you do? I disconnect the controller. You know, of course, what are they going to do if, it, if they burn up a body controller? You know, if you're welding in a body shop, the way that you can guard against that, the best way to guard against it is to take your welding machine and ground it really, really close to what you're welding so that it's not going somewhere else. Mm -hmm. If you ground it up somewhere else where it goes through an engine control on the way to find ground, that 220 volts is going to fry it. All right, let's, uh, we're whipping through this really quick. An engine's being investigated for an overheating problem. The engine started after a six-hour cold soak and allowed to run for 60 seconds. A hissing sound of escaping pressure is heard when the radiator cap is removed. What does that mean? Huh? After the radiator cap is been removed. All right. Been sitting all night. Crank it up. 60 seconds. Switch it off. Take the radiator cap off. Mm. What does that mean? Heater uh, cores. One of the, what? One of the head gaskets. Head gaskets. Fire ring. Head gasket. That's mm -hmm. what you're looking at there. A loose fuel filler cap will generally set what code? Anybody remember? Uh, I'm going to say the PO41. What? No, that's the cam sensor. A PO 455 is usually what you'll get when you got a clear. <laughs> that's kind of funny. The service manager one day says, I know you're about to go to lunch, but I got a Lincoln out here. I need you to find out what a check engine light is, and I'll buy your lunch. Mm -hmm. You know, if you'll check it for me right quick. 
is on there, plugged the scan tool in, got a fuel 50, 455, went back there, they left the gas cap loose, I clicked it on there, cleared the code. All right, right here, I got some lunch. He goes, it's still two minutes to 12, I ain't buying your lunch. It's again your ear. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't care. I mean, you know, it was, I, I fixed it in two, three minutes, you know. Okay, variable cam timing is commonly used for what? When oh, I wrote this boy. test, it was used for NOx control. That's you close, what I put. You yeah, you close the intake exhaust valves early, leave some exhaust gas in there so you don't have to recirculate it, and that keeps your oxides of nitrogen for me. However, nowadays, variable valve timing is used for just about everything. They use it for power, they use it for emissions, they use it for all kinds of stuff. Retarded chem timing what can cause... It? Uh, NOx control. Retarded chem timing can cause what? All of them. All of the above, low engine vacuum, rich air fuel mixture, late and hard transmission shifts. Why does it cause late and hard transmission shifts? Low power, you're yeah. deeper into the throttle, that raises the pressure, boom, it hits hard. Okay, now then, let us go now, while we're here, into this weak link thing. Now, there's weak links in just about all vehicles. Uh, some more serious than others. What can you think of that fails? On a lot of vehicles that you know about. Have you seen multiple failures on one particular kind of vehicle that you know about? Oh, we pick up the coil packs about in like an angle. The coil packs are, are really sorry. Now, I will tell you what was interesting. Yours has the older kind of coil pack that's a lot stronger than these new little coil packs. So I'm saying they've gone back to that because apparently they're trying to correct that. I mean, my 07 model pickup truck and my 07 Taurus both have the same little coil packs, and I've already had to replace it on both of them, so you got a good point there. That's a weak link. Some uh, late 90s Ford Explorers came with intake gaskets that leaked air when they were cold. Crank it up, idles rough, it's, and you look at your fuel trims, you know, it closes the loop really quick because those heated oxygen sensors start coming online real fast. And if you look at fuel trim numbers that are kind of going off to the positive side, meaning it's correcting for a lean condition, and then they clean up it back when it gets warm, you're looking at intake gaskets. And the intake gaskets are little plastic intakes are just basically little silicone O-rings anyway, they ain't hard to change. It's an easy job to do and all that kind of stuff. Now those little four-cylinder Kia engines like to burn at least one valve at about 100,000 miles. And the, also if a Kia jumps time, it'll break the uh, heads off valves and they bounce around in there. They destroy the head, they destroy the piston, they knock holes in every darn thing. And so that's one of the reasons that this Kia engine we're putting in this little uh, 05 Sportage out here, LKQ doesn't even want the core back. But usually whenever you're replacing the engine, it's because it's jumped time and it's, been, and it's destroyed everything, so they don't even want it. It's just scrap iron. They said, this one was running. It was just knocking because, you know, it started for all. Hey, girl. Can what's up with your bed? Huh? Can I borrow you for a second? Yeah, what you need here? I just want to grab a, a different color. Yeah, what's over there? Well, this is what you need for sure. Mm -hmm. I was going to go to the beach Saturday. I just want to make sure it was like, what's up there. And it's kind of like, it, it's like, it smells burnt sometimes. It's not running hot, but something smells like it's burning. Okay, that's that Honda you got there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, hand the keys to Katie, the girl in there, mm -hmm. and uh, we'll try to get something done about that. Okay. All right. Okay, now then, uh, so anyway, uh, we're going to discover a situation where several similar vehicles are given the same problem. There's a weak link in that car's chain of parts and processes, and discover that weak, weak link is good. Why is it good? It's like money in the bank. You know why? Because the next time one comes in, you already know. You already know what it is, and you say, you know, boom, boom, I've done this before, snap, snap, click, click, you get paid the labor time for that, you've done it, in, you may be through with it in 15 or 20 minutes, and it may take pay two hours. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So knowing those weak links is important. Now, the guys that work at a dealership, where they always work on the same kind of cars, usually know the weak links on their own cars. And some of the rest of us might be scratching around trying to find That's one of the reasons Identifix is so good, because you actually can look and you can see what usually fails on these. Now, we actually had one the other day. You remember the one that was throwing all the misfire codes? Yeah. All right. That's basically, uh, most of those have been tight valves and need the valves adjusted. Now, who in the world has still got valves adjusted on a 2006 model car except Honda? You know what I mean? That's brilliant. Uh, but anyway, so one of my jobs is to show you guys this stuff. That's part of what I'm trying to do here is so you'll be. Uh, Sam over at, um, whenever Sam went to work over at, uh, in Andalusia, the dealership over there, uh, he got a Chevrolet truck in there, and they said, yes, my customers don't work on this truck. And, you know, so he says, they said, see what you can do with it. And so he checked the fuses, didn't see anything, pulled up, found a TSB, said, you reflash the engine controller, takes care of the instrument cluster problem. He flashed the engine controller, took care of the engine cluster problem, turned the ticket in. And the service manager said, I'm so glad you did this because we put seven instrument clusters in in the last two weeks, and we haven't fixed anything that way. 
and you're the first one that's fixed it. He went to a TSB and found the fix. See what I'm saying? And uh, he was a really, uh, but anyway, that was smooth and he liked that. Now, I did drivability work at a uh, dealership where I worked for about the last 15 years. And we had these silly little, you know what a K car is? A Chrysler K car? Yeah. A funky little K car. It was a strange little front wheel drive car with a 2.2 liter engine, a timing belt, all this kind of junk on it. Yeah. And uh, it had a carburetor on it. And these phone company people that, that were driving, we had the GTE telephone company contract, you know, and a lot of them drove those cars. And they were cheap cars. I mean, it was a cheap little Chrysler vehicle. So the uh, carburetors, uh, we would fool with, we didn't have any literature on those things. We just had to wing it and figure out what was wrong with it. I hated that. I'd like to have something to read. Well, they would, when an air conditioner kicked on, they would boom, boom, and almost die. And the people that drove them were always crabbing about that, and they said, we weren't doing a good job, and all this kind of thing. Well, I started talking to the Chrysler instructors when I go to Chrysler school, because we had a Jeep franchise. And when I go to the, the Chrysler school, they would say, uh, everybody was talking about it, but nobody knew what to do about it. And finally, there was this guy that was one much older than me, but he was a sort of a drunk, you know. I mean, they had legendary stories about him going up there and getting drunk and getting in trouble with the law in Atlanta, you know. <laughs> but I told him, I said, what do we do on, the, on these things when we're having all this problem, I guess? He says, I'll tell you what you're going to need to do on that to fix that. He says, flat file the bottom of that carburetor and you'll probably fix that. Well, I wanted to find a way to determine if that was a problem. Next time one comes in, and I would get in my oxygen system with the meter, and whenever that thing, the air conditioner would kick on, that oxygen, it would almost die, and then it would come back. And I took a little bit of carburetor spray, you know, with a little straw in it, and right there at the base of the carburetor, when it tried to die, I would just go, Psh! just a tiny little spritz. And I saw the oxygen sensor immediately respond to that. And I said, that sucker looks tight, it looks flat, but it's not sealing. It's pulling enough air in there to where it's making a lean condition, you know. And so I took and I blew the gas out of the carburetor, because you don't take a carburetor and turn it upside down, because all that trash is settled in the bowl, gets in the jets, and it won't run over the awesome. the flow of Yeah, and all kinds of stuff goes on. But anyway, I gently blew the gas out of it, dried it out real good. And I put, turned it upside down, put it in a vise, and you know, you, when you flat file it, you basically took a, a big long ass file, and you make sure that you're making full contact every time. I saw on the ends of that thing, and it was a long skinny carburetor, you know, that was, and I, and I noticed it getting shiny on the ends, and the more I filed it, the more those shiny places came together, and I got rid of this dip that was in the middle of the carburetor. You wouldn't let you see with your naked eye, but that flat file would pick it up. Put it back on, buckle it down. <laughs> Usually when I'd park one of those things, the shop foreman would go drive it, and whenever he went and drove it, I would know it. You know, we did everything we could to try to straighten him out. We'd adjust the carburetor. We'd do this. We'd look for vacuum leaks, and we never really could get him to run right. And I would always hide because I didn't want him to come back in there and say, oh, I guess you need to work on it some more, you know. Well, that day, when he came walking in after I did that with that one, because it was perfect. I went out walking out to meet him. What do you think about that car I just worked on? He goes, oh, that car runs mighty good. I don't know what you done to it, but it runs better than I've ever seen. And I told him, I filed it off. And he was just, wow. And after that, it become real easy to fix those suckers. That was the weak link. You got me? I found the weak link, and man, I was fixing them things left and right. When you get to where you know what the weak link is, you just have fun with it. All right. Okay. This guy that brought this truck to me, he contacted the Toyota T10 school over there and when they were in Wallace, and they weren't interested in doing a job on a 350 Chevy engine because there was a lot of water coming out of it. He described his problem as a water leak from under the cylinder head, and I started to say, well, you're assuming a lot Water was pouring out as fast as he poured it in. And I'm going to show you some pictures in a minute. It's pouring out just as fast as he poured it in. That, is that going to be coming from under the cylinder head? No. I mean, when you pour it in, I mean, it was just running right out on the ground from somewhere else. That right there turned out, when we did it, it turned out to be a intake gasket. And those plastic and silicone intake gaskets they put on a lot of these V engines nowadays fail like that all the dadgum time. I mean, I don't care if it's on a Dodge, a Chevrolet, or a Ford, or whatever it's on. Those things are going to fail, and, and the water leak is what... And imagine that happening when you're about a thousand miles into a trip on an interstate. Oh, God. You know what I mean? That's yeah. scary as all get out, isn't it? I mean, then all of a sudden, poof, you know, you can burn one up that way. Anything that's plastic that's carrying coolant, that's a bad bet. And whatever all our radiators made out of nowadays, plastic and aluminum. Mm -hmm. You know, and it seems to me like if you're going to protect somebody from a failure, if you can get them to agree to it, it's not a bad idea to replace a radiator about every 120,000 miles with a new one. But the only problem we got now, a lot of our radiators are coming out of China, and we've replaced radiators, and less than three months later had to replace them again because they started to leak. Have you guys seen that around here? Yeah. 
I mean, so it's got up there. Belt tension or something else that, you know, goes bad and it'll just pop all of a sudden. All right. So we pull this intake. CSFI. What's CSFI? Central sequential fuel injection. You know the you know the uh, one that um, he pulled off the intake and the spider. It's got the poppets and it's got the curved lines going down in there underneath the intake. And uh, and each one of those is fed by a separate solenoid in that little uh, spider assembly. Okay, so we had to pull all that stuff off. So we had to pull air AC compressor bracket off. Go just got to get the intake off uh, to make that happen. The power. In fact, my dad's truck. Who did my dad's truck? Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the Garrett, the uh, that truck was the same kind of truck. Mm -hmm. Now you know that little fitting where you put the heater hose in there. You know it clicks in on the front side over there. Mm -hmm. You know that aggravating thing. You know was the same deal on this. Anyway, uh, back whenever I was uh, first starting out, every intake manifold, just about every intake manifold that I ever had to pull off was made out of cast iron. And on these big block engines, that cast iron engine went away 150 pounds. I mean, it was heavy as all get out. These I plastic ones now, you go, zing, 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 you just pop it off. Some of them, when they went to aluminum, they keep making everything lighter and lighter. But the point is, having, you know, that old big block engine, you know, and if you're putting that thing back on, you had to have perfect control over it, or if you put it back on and move it, you've moved your gasket, now you got a daggum oil leak or something. That's a pain, too. So you got to have people help. You know, you did a couple of guys, you know, usually. Me and my dad did it on that 79 truck. Remember the one I drove up? Yep. There you go. Well, the gasket had disintegrated at the water passage on the guilty corner of the intake. And after we cleaned it out, he starts putting it back together. Now, I'm going to start going through my pictures here. There's the truck. See the truck? Mm -hmm. There's the intake gasket. What do you think about that? That's just terrible. That's the intake gasket. It's just, it's just awful. Bad news. All right, so here we go. Move to the next picture. Now, while he had this thing off, these stiff lines, he didn't have any trouble with it, did you? These stiff lines, these fuel lines, they had all over in there, and then you got these. He messed the threads up. Hmm. Well, that is not a simple thing to fix, so we had to take a thread file and we had to work on the threads and all that kind of stuff. You know, sometimes one of the worst things you can do is get a, one of those stiff lines, like a brake line or something, or a power steering line started where you think. It's beginning to start, and you say, I think I can take a wrench and work that on in there. Well, what happens when you do that is you cross-thread cross it, and then you either screw up what you're putting it into or that or both. And that's what happened here. He didn't screw up the part he was screwing it into. He screwed this up. Fortunately, they were for, they made this a little bit softer than the dadgum other part of the truck. And so one way or another, he had to work on that and get it screwed in there. And this is not a simple matter because, you know, you don't want any kind of leak there. All right, so, well, there was another one while he's working on this. We had one, a Chevrolet pickup truck, that was uh, the one that Gene drives. Every now and then, it is going to start. And, it, and then they let it sit for about 20 minutes and then fire up. What do you think that might be? This was consistent, and there's no telling when it was liable to do it. Were they maxing the gas pedal? Not really. They were just trying to start it normally, like they always did. They just went, no, no, no. So I went out here and checked spark, I checked fuel pressure, and it did it right outside of here one day. And it turned out when I plugged the scan tool in, it had a, a 1601 code, I think it was for the uh, security system. So it had an issue with that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But before I ran into that problem, I was doing some research on it, and the, the air conditioner uh, hose likes to drip on that. Oh, let me stop for a second to mention this. On a Montana, like a 2001 Montana, uh, this goes through the floorboard back to the fuel pump right in front of the wheel on the driver's side. These are the two sides of the connector. We had a no start that came in here and somebody had already put a fuel pump in. And this is what we found. Whenever we checked it with the test light, took the test light to power, took it to the cavity to go into the pump, we actually kicked the gas tank and it came on and made us think it was a fuel pump problem. We investigated it a little further with the jiggle this connector. Look at this garbage. See this stuff right here? That thing is right down where the wheel is throwing salt splash up on it and all kinds of stuff. Of course, it's supposed to be weatherproof, but you know how that goes. All right. So anyway, let me move on over here. That was just a little sideline here. Oh, and here's another one. Let's stop for a second on this weak link before we finish our other story. My wife and I were driving to Florida from North Carolina on our 2004 Kia radio broke down. The time of belt broke. Subsequently, the entire engine needs to be replaced. What was I talking about? Right. 
We owe seven thousand dollars on the Kia. My question was, would you, what would you advise in sinking another three thousand dollars into the Kia with ninety thousand miles? They were supposed to have changed the timing belt, and they just kept driving. And I don't know how many people do that. It's not a big deal on that two point four that Lundy put the timing belt on, or who's that? Come on, Lundy, who's that? Who put the timing belt on two point four the other day? Was that Lundy? It was Lundy. Okay, so. That one don't bend valves, it don't break, and they don't snap off like this. Most of the time it does bend them, they won't snap them off. But on this little Kia, the little, they're kind of like a Toyota, the little valves are about the size of a bridge that's trapped a lawnmower valve, and they break off. Couldn't this been, have been avoided? Think about that. Imagine yourself in a position where you owe $7,000, and now it's going to be another 3000 to get the engine replaced. Got it? Look at this one here. Fire starter. Ignition switch. Well, some of your older Fords, it was supposed to, this part right here was supposed to stay up, and this was supposed to take crimped in so it holds that together, the electrical part of it. But they recalled 8,000 of those trucks, I think it was. It could have been more than that. I don't remember a bunch of them over there at, uh, when I was at, at Ford Place. And we had to replace those ignition switches. The ignition switch, you could buy one of those recall switches if you wanted to buy one for $2.50. Now, the original price was more than that, but the recall switch, they don't ever charge very much for it. Long and short of it was we had to replace them because they could cause a fire. One time, this guy had a yeah, 87 F-150 on the front end lift over there. He had it up in the air, kind of like we have two horizontal alignments here. And, when, and that darn thing caught fire, that ignition switch, and you could see flames coming up through the dash on the windshield. It just destroyed the truck. You know, they got a, a recall on Chevy Cobalt. You got that they right. They got the... One, uh, Stuff dang on the key. Yeah. They just cut off. Right yeah, 1.3 million cars they recalled for the. They said just use the key that starts the car. Don't let a bunch of yeah. keys hang on it. But we've all got heavy stuff hanging on our keys, and that ain't really a good thing on some of them. And those are a bit of problem. Okay. Right here. Oil pump overheating failure. Now this right here is dying. Right here. We actually thought a lot of the time on these Camrys. The 2.2 is like one we got our stand out here. Up there behind the camshaft, I mean behind the uh, timing cover, on the camshaft, that seal will get hard and it'll start leaking. It'll just dribble all, so you can't really see where it's coming from, but it's dripping on the floor over on the passenger side of the car. This right here is that O-ring. You remember my son's car when it was in here, and he drove it over here, and he was dumping a quarter every 100 miles yeah. of oil? That's, the, that's what the failure was on him. You see, and this other shop over there assumed it was the oil pan gasket, and they changed the oil. But this is not his car. This is a different car. This is the car Alan Cobb used to drive. And we finally, when we put that dye in there, shining the light, we saw it was coming from around the oil pump. And uh, and that was that's fairly common on those on those 2.2 liter cameras. All right. Now we got plastic parts here. We'll get back to another story in a minute. Huh? Plastic parts. Yep. Plastic parts. Here we go. Look at this one here. That '93 uh, Buick. Broke this fitting right here. Now, some of you might have seen this on my technical rider page. I've put some of these pictures on there. All right, so that, that, that one popped. Just without warning. I mean, you had to pull the alternator off to see it. It wasn't anything you could see without pulling the alternator off. But, I mean, it would ever flush a lot of coolant from behind the alternator when you poured it in. That's what it looked like. Certain thing with plastic. And it broke. Now, why in the same hill would anybody put a fitting like that and let hot coolant go through it in plastic? A lot of them do that. This replacement fitting that I got from the parts house was made for this car, and it was steel. Mm. Got it? Better fitting. No more failures of that kind. They could have done that. All right, what's wrong with this picture? Um, Somebody tell me. They had a tie and worn down. Is that a donut? It looks like a donut, don't it? No, that's a regular tire. What's that fender? Is this rubbing a fender? Mm -hmm. No, that's, this is evident. It will, it's in your face. This is an in your face problem. Isn't that super long back? <laughs> Look at the lug nuts, guys. They all fell backwards. backwards. Do you know how many times I've seen that in here? Uh, People uh, I do not remember a time in my life when I didn't know how lug nuts went on. You know, when I was five years old, I knew how lug nuts went on. But every time I turned around, somebody's putting them on backwards now, not in this group. But I've actually had one of our state cars in here, and I pull the hubcap off, and the stupid lug nuts are on backwards. Now, they're not likely to come off, but that ain't the right way to put them on there, and it makes you look real silly if you're working in a shop somewhere and you put them on backwards like that. I've seen that about 50 times.
People quit this stupid love that song backwards. That's a what's wrong with this picture thing right there. All right, here's another weak link. How they fail. These little fingers like to wear out before they move on this gas gauge. This is the new one. The fingers are redesigned so they're longer. That's only the 2000 vintage, a couple of three years on either side of that GM. Uh, and all of them have got the same center. You can buy just the sending unit from General Motors. And it's about $150 or something like that. You don't have to put the whole fuel pump in there for that. You can't get it from the parts part, parts people. All right. Now, what we did, after we got the Chevrolet fixed, we said we had a mass airflow and code, right? Okay. There was the cam position sensor was not getting anything. A mass airflow wasn't getting anything. And so we found out we had a blown fuse. All right, so we have a blown fuse. So I got this little thing here. You can buy this little adapter, you know, from some of your tool trucks and all that's made to go in where a fuse goes. And then you got these two terminals right here. And look what I did. I came off of these two terminals. I hooked them to a circuit breaker, which is like that, 8 amps. And then, coming off the other side, I put a light bulb. When the circuit breaker's open, the light bulb's on. I hook it under the fuse and plug. As soon as we put a fuse in there, it went pop. Okay, so I hooked this in instead of the fuse. My circuit breaker's clicking off and on. Ding, 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 ding. And that light comes on. You can hear the darn thing clicking up there. Okay, so then I go to look at the schematic. We got a mass airflow schematic. This is the fuse that's blowing right here, right? Ignition positive voltage goes here. It also goes here. It also goes to the EGR. You see? And it goes other way. There's, it goes to your evaporation emission canister, you know, purge valve and all that. Uh, but that's not really the only place it goes. Although if you look at this schematic, you might be fooling into thinking that was the only place it goes. Okay. Look at here. The same dead dumb fuse feeds this. What do we see here? Do I see heaters? See that? All of them. All the oxygen sensor heaters are fed, or are fed by that. I started disconnecting the stuff that was fed by it, waiting for my circuit breaker to quit tripping. And when I got to this oxygen sensor right here, my circuit breaker stopped tripping. And what did that mean? That means the heater in the oxygen sensor was internally shorted. Does that make any sense? Okay, put an oxygen sensor on it, mass airflow. Initially, listen, you get a mass airflow sensor code, what do you typically want to do? Yeah. Throw a mass airflow sensor at it, right? That wasn't a good idea. You unplug the mass airflow sensor and you check on your pink black wire on that one and if it ain't hot, you better find out what's going on. Put a fuse in. If it pops, you start unplugging stuff that it goes to, find out what it is it's causing it to pop. Now you can keep throwing fuses in there and letting them pop. You know, in other words, put a fuse in there and pop it, unplug something, put a fuse in there and pop it. I like to do my circuit breaker thing. And that is a circuit breaker like this one right here. You can buy these circuit breakers you sniff around, find them on the internet or wherever. I bought that one from Barnes Distribution uh, right there. Okay, now here's the hose drip issue I started talking about a while ago. This air conditioner hose is the suction line. What does the suction line do on an AC system? It sweats. Okay, that sweat's going to go where? Right there. Whenever it sweats, it drips on the distributor, so we really don't want it dripping on the distributor, do we? And so what we did was we decided to put a cap and a rotor on it. Somebody told me, you know, hey, cap and rotor usually has to be replaced. Well, I pull that cap and rotor off. I just did it wrong with it. You know, sometimes if you got enough resistance, it'll burn through this rotor. And but I said, well, this is probably not going to fix a daggum thing. It don't cost much. I'm going to throw it on there. And I'm going to, you know, because there has been some dripping going on there. But it really hadn't been enough to really hurt anything. Okay, so here we go. So... After we put it in there, he drove it for a month. And it didn't quit anymore. And one day it did it again. That's when I went out and checked everything, found that code on the uh, uh, security system. Now, on these GM cars, my son had a uh, 99 uh, Malibu that he still drives. And it, it, it did this uh, stuff where you would park it. You know, he's in the Navy. He'd go up there and he'd park. He'd go on the ship. And when he'd come back off, he wait. He had to sit there for 20 minutes. It times out. Why do they do that? To begin with, if you're a car thief and you're trying to steal the car and it makes you wait 20 minutes, you're not happy about that because you want to steal the car and be gone. You want to be gone in 60 seconds kind of guy. And so that's what they do. Now the GM people, giving them credit, 
even if you have a failure and it doesn't know your key anymore because of your ignition switch transponder and all that kind of stuff, they will still enable you to drive the car. You just got to wait a little while before you can fire it up and go. Can the keyless entry system, I mean, I mean, can the security system kill the car going down the road? Yes. No. The only time it pays any attention to that is when you're starting a car. Once the car started, the security system couldn't care less. So basically, that's one of the reasons. So anyway, that was that situation had to be taken care of when the ignition switch on that one. All right, so uh, let me make sure we're doing that right. I'm going to make sure I don't forget anything. Okay, uh, the little, let me see. Look at this. After we put the, uh, look at the trigger, this is something else I want to show you. The camera retard is really, really, really important on these CSFI engines. It's also important on uh, Jeeps and Dodge pickups and the ones that have distributors. they got a cam sensor in there but no crank sensor. So you basically, you're going to need to adjust that. Right? There's an adjustment on the cam. Always find out if there's an adjustment on the cam sensor. It's important to make that check. And it makes more of a difference on some than it does others. Now this hard start situation on this Pathfinder out here, it would, it would start up every time, but it would sometimes it spin a long time. And we had a cam sensor code, and it was a right bank cam sensor code, which does a particular job on that one. We had to replace a cam sensor for that. That was a known concern. That was a weak link, right? We do that all the time. Camera chart offset is supposed to be set on most of these at zero. At a, when you over a thousand RPM, you turn the distributor and it gets to zero, and then you lock it down. But you've got to check it over a thousand RPM. Pick your head up, Joe. You got to pull, you got to put your over a thousand RPM. If it's under a thousand RPM, you get accurate reading. Okay, so it's really important to do that. Flash. Huh? Yeah, there he is. He's, he's running. All right, so I saw where he was going too. All right, so here we go. Uh, that particular thing right there, I'll tell you what happens on those. What people will do on these darn things, and I've seen this more than a few times, is the guy comes to me and he'll say, I had to have intake gaskets put on my Tahoe or whatever, and it's got one kind of in it, or like my dad's pickup. And they say, after that, I'm getting lousy gas mileage, and it doesn't quite run the same. And they tell me there's nothing wrong with it. Well, what they did was they didn't set the camera to an offset. You got me? Okay, they come to the fact that they didn't set the camera to all right. They didn't set the camera retard offset, and that causes, what does it do when it, when it doesn't see a valid cam sensor signal? It actually starts bank firing the injectors instead of firing them sequentially, and that's going to affect your gas mileage. It bank fires the injectors when the cam sensor is not, I mean, signal is not there or is uh, not reliable or if it's way out. You're also setting rotor alignment on those when you do that. That's really important to know that. So uh, I will tell you the one thing that ticks me off about that. The Genesis scan tool that we use to do this one doesn't have that anymore in its data stream after I did the update, the most recent update to it. But that old Autel MaxiDOS thing we got does have it. <laughs> you know what I mean? So you got to have a scan tool to do that. All right. Here's another one. This guy, he numbered this. This is a guy, he's a soldier, and he had this Bronco R right here, and he numbered it 1542. Six, three, seven, eight. And he said, you got one head gasket. I just want to donate it to the school. I said, okay. I found out after he donated it to the school that it was a 351, which was a 5.8, and the firing order is not 1542637A like it is on a 302, which looks like the same engine. It's 1372654A. And the reason he thought I had a blown head gasket was because he had it wired up like a 302. And it was running kind of halfway because it's like every other one is swapped around, you know, basically what it amounts to. All right, now let me go here. This is what happens whenever you spill toner all over your desk. <laughs> you like that? Good job. I didn't like it worth a flip. I was full with this toner cartridge and it got away from me <coughs> all over my desk. Well, the thing about it is it's just kind of uh, dry powder, so I managed to vacuum it off with a vacuum cleaner, but that looks like a disaster area, doesn't it? All right. Oh, my. Yeah. And that ends that little session there. All right, everybody learned something from that. Everybody happy with that? You got you got anything out of you?